Welcome to the fourth lesson of my Mechanics of Materials course. In this lesson, we will be going over average normal stress, specifically in an axially loaded bar. So let's begin by looking at an example of an axially loaded bar. So let's say we have a cylindrical metal bar that is subjected to an axial load P. And of course, remember that an axial load is simply one that acts along the longitudinal axis, just like you see here. And just for reference, note that this circular section on top is considered the cross section of the bar. And for this example, let's say that the longitudinal axis is the y axis. And now let's say we were to make a cut that splits this bar in two. And of course, we can expect, for instance, the bottom part to look something like this, where we would then be able to observe the internal forces that are generated from the load P, in this case, the normal force. And of course, in this simple case, for equilibrium, we would expect N to be equal to P. So the internal normal force would be equal in magnitude to the load P. And hopefully, based on our knowledge of statics and equilibrium, this is intuitive enough. And now the region on top, just below our cut, is the cross-sectional area of our rod. And if you remember from the previous lesson, this area is essential for determining the normal stress in this rod, since of course stress is equivalent to force per unit area. And now before moving forward with our analysis of materials and the way they interact with external forces, we must have a list of key assumptions about the materials properties. First, we must assume that the body is made of homogeneous material, which basically means that it's of uniform material throughout. So it essentially has the same physical and mechanical properties throughout the material. So that is one key assumption we must remember. Next, we must also assume that the body is made of isotropic material, which basically means that it has the same properties in all directions. So its physical and mechanical properties are constant regardless of direction or location. And now also note that many engineering materials which we come across can be approximated as both homogeneous and isotropic, which of course allow us to carry out the theoretical analyses throughout this study of solid mechanics. And now just to help visualize a homogeneous material, let's say we have this body made of homogeneous material where each of these dots represent particles. And for instance, let's say we have particle one, particle two, and so on. So now, if this is homogeneous material, then that means that that particle one must be equal to particle two, which should be all equal to every other particle within this body. So particle one equals particle two, which equals any arbitrary particle n. And now for an isotropic material, of course, this now depends on directions. So let's say, for instance, we have our x, y, and z plane. In this case, we will expect a particle along the x axis to be equal to a particle on the y, and of course, equal to a particle on the z. And again, this is simply because the material has the same properties in all directions, x, y, and z. So again, the key point is essentially that we are considering material that has uniform physical and mechanical properties both throughout the material and in every direction. Now let's go ahead and look at axial normal stress distribution. So first, let's recall that equilibrium pretty much requires the resultant normal force N within a body that is subjected 
to external loads to be equal to that external load P. So N equals P, exactly like we saw back in the first example. And of course, this is after the bar is split in two. So again, N equals P due to static equilibrium. And now for an axial normal stress distribution, we must consider that the material undergoes keyword uniform deformation. And so as a result of uniform deformation, the cross section is essentially subjected to constant normal stress distribution. And also note that each small area delta A is subject to a small force delta n equals sigma delta a where each of these small forces delta n sum up to equal load p so now let's consider average normal stress again this is sigma equals n the internal normal force over a the cross-sectional area where sigma is of course the average normal stress at any point. And so rearranging this equation for n, we of course have n equals sigma times a, which is how the small force equation delta n equals sigma delta a was derived. Now let's go ahead and look at a bar that is specifically under tension, just to help visualize these internal interactions. Referencing the Mechanics of Materials book, I'll go ahead and add this cross-section element here in blue. And just below that, we'll find the small internal normal forces delta N. And on top, the average or total normal force N. And at the bottom, we'll have, of course, the external force P, which in this case should be equivalent to N due to equilibrium. And again, this represents a bar in tension. And now I'll just go ahead and add a small element block within this material that represents normal stress and tension. And then the average normal stress is, of course, the average of all these small normal forces divided by the average of each small area, in other words, the cross-sectional area. So this completes our diagram for tension. And now let's go ahead and look at compression. This will overall look very similar, except of course, the direction of our forces are now flipped, this time pushing into the bar rather than pulling. But overall, the average normal stress is of course calculated the same. So hopefully this helps further visualize the internal interactions that occur from different types of axial loading. Now let's specifically look at the concept of uniaxial stress. For instance, like in tension or compression, whenever material is subjected to this type of stress, the normal stress components on an element, just like the one I drew above, must be equal in magnitude, but opposite in direction. And this is of course, in order to uphold static equilibrium. So again, the normal stress components must be equal in magnitude, but opposite in direction, just like how we see them in this stress element above. The directions of the stress arrows are of course in the opposite direction, but they should be equal in magnitude for that equilibrium. Now let's go ahead and briefly go over maximum average normal stress. So here, let's note that a bar may occasionally be subjected to several axial loads or a change in its cross-sectional area may occur. So again, it can be subjected to multiple axial loads or there can be a change in cross-sectional area. And so as a result, the normal stress within the bar may differ from section to section. 
And well, this is because a constant normal stress will, of course, rely on a constant normal force and a constant cross-sectional area, just like in our previous examples. And so for the case of non-constant normal stress, if the maximum average normal stress is needed, then it is imperative to find the location where the ratio n over a is, of course, maximum. So this will, of course, require a slightly more complex analysis. But hopefully this procedure outlined here is generally intuitive enough to understand. So just to wrap up here, let's go ahead and summarize the key points for this lecture. When a body subjected to external loads is sectioned, then there is a force distribution that acts over the area holding each body segment in equilibrium. Next, stress is the limiting value of force per unit area as area approaches zero. And for this, of course, we consider material to be continuous and uniform throughout. Next, the magnitude of stress components at a point depends on the type of loading acting on the body and the orientation of the element at that particular point. And finally, the center region of a prismatic bar of homogeneous and isotropic material subjected to an axial force acting through the centroid of the cross-sectional area will deform uniformly, and the normal stress due to the axial force will be uniform or averaged out over the cross-sectional area. So again, these are very important points that should be noted throughout this course, as this will not only help you understand internal interactions from axial loads, but also to help you form your list of assumptions and considerations when analyzing axial loads. Thank you for watching and I'll catch you on the next video.